Good morning. Have you ever received a really memorable text? It's probably hard to think of a singular great text that you have gotten. Uh, that's just not usually the nature of text. They're little brief messages that we tend to quickly forget. Now, some of us old codgers refer to Bible passages as texts as well. Uh, we were doing that before phone texting ever was heard of. But if you think of text in, in that sense, then what's the greatest text that you have ever received from God? Uh, maybe that's something worth thinking about today. One of the great texts, of course, is John 3.16. No doubt, uh, one of the greatest texts ever given by God. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, it's often been called the golden text of the Bible, and for good reason. It's a great summary in one verse of the message of this great book that we study. God so loved the world. God sent his son. God offers salvation and eternal life. Well, that's a verse, of course, that has been preached and taught as much as any other down through history. And volume after volume has no doubt been written about it and many words used to expound it. And your approach to it could be as good or better than mine would be. One of the things that I learned from some wise teachers is that uh, sometimes the best commentary on a text of scripture will be another text of scripture. In other words, the Bible often interprets and applies itself. Now, uh, in my own personal library, and maybe in yours, you'll find many commentaries on Scripture. Uh, and commentaries are just books where uh, the author tries to interpret and explain, and maybe even apply certain sections of, of, of the Bible. Uh, some commentaries are done well, and some of them are stinkers, frankly. And I'm sure if you looked it up, you would find a lot of words that have been written about John 3.16. But very often it's the case that the best commentary on a verse like John 3.16 is another verse somewhere else in the Bible. And one thing about using the Bible to interpret the Bible is you know the Bible is right. It's from God. And so you don't have to be concerned with human error and bias and that kind of thing when interpreting Bible with Bible. As long as you both as long as you interpret both verses correctly. And so I think perhaps the best and greatest commentary ever written on the golden text of the Bible, John three sixteen, for God so loved the world is actually a text from 1 John. In fact, it's really convenient because it's really easy to remember. 1 John 3, 16. If you want a great commentary on John 3, 16, turn to 1 John 3, 16. And another nice thing about it is that it's really brief. It's just one verse and most commentaries I've found are usually much longer than they need to be. Um, I have a commentary here, for instance, on the Gospel of John. It's a great commentary, one of the best, uh, by D.A. Carson. And it runs over 700 pages. And I have another commentary. It's two volumes on the Gospel of John. Not so great a commentary, uh, so I won't show you it. But it is over 1,100 pages. But here in 1 John 3.16, we have just one verse, one line of commentary. Uh, 
the same author wrote them both, of course, John the Apostle. And uh, he is the author, the recorder of the golden text, John 3.16. Let's remember a little bit, first of all, the context of that great verse. Uh, remember what was going on. Um, a man named Nicodemus had come to Jesus. He came at night to visit with him, we imagine, to uh, have it sort of private and hidden. He had a conversation with the Lord. He had some questions for Jesus, and Jesus had some answers. And among the great truths that Jesus told him was the fact that, that he must be born again, uh, that Nicodemus must be born again. And he also told him uh, just before verse 16 that the Son of Man, referring to himself, was going to be lifted up, uh, that, that he was... You know, there he, of course, he's referring to the cross, and that whoever believed in him would receive eternal life. That's in verse 15 of John 3. Then, of course, the famous words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Well, let's consider uh, one, one of the greatest commentaries on this verse ever written, and it's written by John himself. In his first letter, 1 John 3.16. 1 John 3.16 says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So John 3.16 talks about love, for God so loved the world. Here in 1 John 3.16, 316 we get the definition of love what does love mean and and here is one of the great contrasts between what the world says and what God says don't miss this the world tells you that love is something that you feel whereas God says Love is something you do. And I'm telling you that a lot of us struggle with the difference between those. A lot of Christians are so shaped by the world that they think that love is a feeling rather than a doing. And that is wrong. They think that when it says, God so loved them, that it means that he had nice, warm, fuzzy feelings about them, that he liked them, that he wanted to be their best buddy. And then in turn, they think that loving God means having certain positive emotional images of God, um, that you like God, that you get all emotional about God, you get all fired up about God. Well, that's the world talking, and not the Bible. In the Bible, love is always something you do, not something necessarily that you feel. It is a doing, not a feeling. You show love by doing, not by feeling. Now, look at what John writes here again, 1 John 3.16. By this we know love, that he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us. Aren't you glad today that Jesus did something, rather than simply felt something? We, we ought to be, folks, because if he hadn't done something, we would all still be lost in our sins. No matter how much he felt for us, I really don't think I'm making too much of this. You know, because I hear too much and too often Christians talking in terms of what they feel. In other words, I'll hear, I don't feel spiritual. I don't feel 
worshipful or I don't feel like worshiping or I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of this. All of those you see totally selfish expressions. And if something is selfish, it is without love, at least godly love. Look at John's definition of love here, 1 John 3.16. He defines it in terms of what love does. It lays down its life. True love is a sacrifice. It is a giving up of self for someone else. Love happens when instead of being selfish, we are other-ish. Instead of being self-centered, we become other-centered. Jesus did it, and we need to do it is the basic message. For God so loved the world. What does that part mean, so loved? God loved us so much that he did something. That is, he sent his son, Jesus, our Savior. He was the only one that he had, and he sent him for us. That's how God loved us. And Jesus, of course, loved us. How do we know? He did something. 1 John 3, 16. He laid down his life for us. He went to the cross and died our death, bore our penalty for sin. He subjected himself to the wrath of God so we wouldn't have to face it. Aren't you glad that he did something? You know, if you read the Gospels closely, we are never told much about what Jesus felt. It's not as if he never shows emotion. I'm not saying that, but you don't hear a lot about what he felt. But we're sure told a lot about what he did. I think here in 1 John 3, verse 16, this great commentary on the golden text of the Bible, that John tells us a couple of important things to remember. First is, he tells us that Jesus laying down his life for us is an example for us to follow. Uh, he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers as it says. Uh, Jesus did something, and we need to as well. Jesus did, so we do. And when we do, we love with the love of God. And, and second, John tells us that Jesus laying down his life for us is a revelation of the extent of God's love for us. You want to understand John 3.16, for God so loved the world, you look at the cross and what God in Christ did. You make that your life's study. What did God do for me in Christ? And the more you know about that, the more you will understand and appreciate what love really is. Not the love of the world, but the love of God. Imagine if you and a friend are standing together at the end of a pier, and your friend suddenly picks up a life preserver and tosses it in the water. He then turns to you and says, See how much I love you? Uh, you're probably going to look at your friend a little strange, aren't you? Uh, you're standing there, safe, on the pier. How does your friend's throwing that life preserver in the water prove his love for you? It doesn't. It, it just doesn't make sense. But imagine, on the other hand, you're in that water and you're struggling, and you've gone down twice 
already and you're ready to go down a third time never to come up again and your friend runs and dives in at great risk to himself and pulls you to safety before you go down I bet that you wouldn't need him even to say I love you to know it would you your life has been saved you know that you're loved. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. This is the word of God. May God add his blessings to it. Shall we pray? Holy Father, thank you for your love demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Help us to be faithful to him and help us to show this love to our world which needs it and hungers for it. Thank you for this day where we can praise you and remember you and honor you and help us to live for you faithfully this week. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.